All right, here we go. The stream should be live. And hello, hello, and welcome. I am Treble Woofer, and you're not. And today we're going to be talking about and analyzing probably everybody's least favorite Beethoven sonata. Well, I mean, it's certainly no one's favorite. I mean, when we speak of the Beethoven sonatas, people usually say, oh, the Appassionata, the Moonlight, the late sonatas, maybe the Heimerklever, maybe some early Beethoven sonatas, but never this sonata, which is exactly why I decided to focus on it today. And it's a, it's one of Beethoven's shorter pieces. It's one of his shorter sonatas. It's roughly about maybe 15 minutes long at the very most, if you play it really slowly. And this sonata was written, there's my marker, in, to help if I had a pen, where is it? Uh, where'd my marker go? I swear I, uh, all right, let's mark it up. See, they hide it up here. Uh, all right. I wanted to go in full screen, but apparently I can't do that. Okay. 1804, thereabouts, is when this piece was written. I'm going to change this size to just a little bit thinner. How's that? 1804 was when this piece was composed. And this is right between the Waldstein Sonata and the appassionata i don't want to spell it all out and this sonata was it was sandwiched between a masterpiece these two towering masterpieces and at this time beethoven was composing the fifth symphony uh the fourth piano concerto uh, the Fifth Symphony would come soon after, so he was very busy. This was in the height of his uh, heroic uh, period, his middle period, so he was at the top of his game right here. He was composing a lot of music at this time, and this piece usually gets thrown under the rug in terms of the, of the uh, sonatas. It's not a very... It's, it's, to be honest, it's not my favorite sonata either, but it's certainly, it's got its merits, and it wasn't a, um, it wasn't as as well executed as you know some of the later more more refined pieces. But still, we can absolutely talk about this piece. So, to avoid getting any copyright strikes, I'm actually going to play a MIDI file, and this MIDI file I've at least tried my best to throw it into Ableton and put on some nice piano sound so it should sound at least half decent. So this is going to be a MIDI recording of the entire sonata. And we are going to go ahead and play the exposition of the first movement. I should mention this is a, it's a plane comes overhead. Maybe I should close the window. I'll do that later. Anyway, this is a two movement sonata, which is Quite, quite unusual, but not too unusual. Haydn wrote several two-movement works, and uh, Beethoven uh, wrote a couple sonatas and two movements. So anyway, enough talk. Let's go ahead and listen to the exposition, and we'll go ahead and proceed after that. So here is the exposition.
Alright. Let's... Nope, 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 nope. Stop. Stop right there. Alright, so... And the plane's busy day at the airport today, we see. So... Exposition, sorry, I know it's a sonata, but this isn't really in sonata form, uh, so to speak. This is, well, let's talk about what we've got. This is a, uh, in a very, it's an A, B, A, B, A, it's like a binary form, sort of, kind of. Uh, well, it is, actually. So, let's get rid of some of this stuff. So this, this sonata is not written in, at least the first movement is not in sonata form. The second movement's uh, much more grounded in sonata form. But this sonata is really an experimentation of Beethoven's. He's, he's trying different things, he's trying different ideas, he's trying different approaches to the sonata, and when we think of this, of course, we think Hammerclever, we think uh, Passionata, we think Waldstein, uh, so on and so forth, maybe Opus 26, so, uh, this is not a not so much, but, um, this, this, this guide, at least this approach, uh, I've got my notes, uh, to this piece is going to be more or less focused on compositional ideas of Beethoven, what he's trying to do with them, how he's making it happen. This is not a harmonic analysis, although there will be times when we will approach certain harmonic uh, analysis type stuff but this isn't going to be sitting here marking out roman numerals so if that's what you're expecting uh, i apologize but i hope i'm through this analysis i'm trying to get the big picture the bigger scope the the, the what what can we take away from this sonata uh, and incorporate it into our own compositions or maybe even approach it differently or have fresh ears or fresh eyes towards this sonata so we can perform it better as a pianist or whatnot. That's really the main goal, and also looking at what Beethoven really wants us to pay attention to. He's not really wa expecting us to do a Roman numeral analysis and being like, oh my gosh, look at this and that and that and that. So that's my goal in this analysis. So the first thing we notice right off the bat is he marks it, is he marks piano, or an F major by the way. He marks it piano, and he says in the tempo of a minuet, uh, not necessarily a minuet, although it can be considered a minuet, so that's that's that. And there's two completely contrasting ideas, which we'll get to as we heard later, but I won't get too ahead of myself. So he starts very simply, uh, piano in the lower register, and this is a very good technique. When you're starting in, when you're starting a piece of music, you want to have somewhere to go. So by starting in the low register, it gives you room to build up musically. He's starting literally at the bottom of the piano right here with this F. The F would have been, uh, at, at this time, at least for a long time in piano manufacturers of around the early 1800s, this would have been the lowest note on the piano. Beethoven would receive later pianos that would extend this range uh, a little bit further down. He would have this low E, and he would play this in the uh, 28th piano sonata. I think it's Opus 101. He would write a, a low E, uh, and he'd use it for an effect. But uh, this is so. This he's starting at the lowest point of the piano, and the voice. This little motive he's going to use. Um, annoyingly a lot <laughs> he's he's going to use this dotted rhythm quite a lot and this simply outlines right here da, da, dum, one and you have a nice four a plagal and he repeats this da, da, dum. he repeats this in a different register he could have just as easily have just written this right here like this um bum bum and I imagine that being a whole note, and just repeated it exactly the same time, copy and paste. Uh, but he doesn't. This, again, gives him room to build musically uh, this phrase. And it's a very simple phrase that he builds over here. Uh, nothing, I mean, and I was doing, while well, doing some research on this sonata, there was a couple 
rather unique anecdotes. Uh, one by uh, a French, a French musicologist. Actually, if you don't mind, let me go on a little tangent. This is interesting. If I go to Wikipedia really quick, uh, uh, let me just type in Sonata 22. And if we pull up the Wikipedia page, here we go. This is very interesting. Now, Donald, France, uh, Donald Francis Tovey is a very notable scholar on music and especially on Beethoven. And he has a, actually, shoot, I'm sorry about that. Um, he's got a book on every single Beethoven sonata. And he, he just breaks it down bit by bit. Now, I have not... I have not done that. I have deliberately not gone and read his review on this, but um, this is the musicologist who I find a little interesting on his interpretation of this piece. He says it's, uh, he's referring to uh, this battle, which I have no idea about. I've never heard of it. Uh, well, I'm from the US, so of course we don't know anything about Europe. So, um, and he's saying that it's depicting certain images about the guillotine and the French Revolution and whatnot, which I do know about that. I do know that it happened and it was a thing. But uh, it's... I think it's a bit far-stretched. Like, like, especially the Allegretto, how he's going into, you know, bars 1 through 36 are painting this. And, and, and you know, I'm I'm a little hesitant to believe this because... Beethoven was not a very programmatic composer, so to speak. He, like in his pastoral uh, symphony, he said, um, what do you say? He said the title page, he says, more feeling than tone painting. And uh, so he's, yeah, it's sort of, some of it is programmatic, but I mean, if Beethoven wanted it to be programmatic, he might, he, he very much titles his pieces or at least the publisher suggests a title for it, and if he's okay by it, then he'll... And then Beethoven will be like, yeah, sure, I guess that sums it up. And, um... But then again, we have accounts of Schindler, uh, supposedly from the Tempest Sonata, and Beethoven might have programs for the Tempest Sonata. He said, read Shakespeare's Tempest. So, you know, we don't really know what he's thinking, but... This, I think, is a little far-stretched, especially this shell whistling using the Doppler effect. Are you kidding me? Like, <laughs> I, I, I I, cannot see this being a thing. Um, Beethoven was not this scientific. Um, but, you know, I could be wrong. And th so this, I think, is um, very pretentious uh, and... Quite frankly, I think it's bullshit, but, you know, it gives the man a job. It gives something for him to, to do, I guess. Anyway, I'm just going to focus on the music. That's going to be, for me, I think for everybody, the most important part of it, is what can we take out of it instead of trying to look for answers that can't be answered. So, we can answer these questions. So, back to the analysis. So, he's going to be repeating this motive and you can see it's a four bar phrase just a very uh very typical four bar phrase that ends right here mum ba dum mum ba dum dum ba dum ba dum ba dum mum ba dum bum ba dum so you repeat something twice so the rule of threes applies right here and this is a very classical phrase right here um and he uses the whole register he goes uh, he starts at the lowest point of the piano and he just soars and has this nice arch to it. So it's it's a very typical way of writing a phrase, but uh, it takes advantage of the registers, which I think is very important in um, composition. And he repeats this again, exactly the same way. Now, why he didn't just write a repeat bar right here I, I don't know, to be honest, because this is exactly the same. He could have very easily just have written a repeat bar, which he has, which he's done before in his sonatas. He doesn't change anything. He doesn't vary anything. He doesn't change any of the voicing. It's exactly the same. So I have no idea why he didn't just use a repeat bar right here. One theory I toyed around with, and this could be wrong, 
it might be due to the fact that the convention at the time when playing music, especially piano sonatas and whatnot, was that repeats were optional. And that's very painful to say, but um, as far as I remember, as far as I know, and if you can correct me if I'm wrong, repeats back at this time were optional. And if Beethoven didn't want this to not be repeated, he would have written it out just as so to force the player to, yes, play it twice. And he does this, uh, he, he does this again. He writes this all out. He could have very easily have just written this as a repeat, as, as a repeat, but he doesn't. Um, but he, he feels the effort is necessary in, in, uh, in expressing the contrast and uh, the structure and the length, so he he very clearly doesn't want this to. Uh, well, he takes the trouble out of the ambiguity of just slapping a repeat right here, and then some people playing it and some people not, and the piece being too short and it feels awkward. And okay, so I think I understand, but that's just my theory. It could be wrong. So he repeats the whole thing over again. And uh, one little thing I'd like to to note that Beethoven's really good at. Uh, other composers are, are more or less decent at this, but uh, you don't see it as as often. His chord balancing. He's got this C, this C pedal, right in the left hand, which creates a one six four. Here's a five seven, and then a one. And we notice how balanced the chords are. And this is why, for example, if you are in a theory class at a conservatory or a uh, music institute, you will be treated with lots of Bach, lots of Bach chorales. And this is exactly the reason why. And uh, it's exactly where it's applicable. If you're spelling out, uh, spelling out an F chord, you... He, he's very keen on balancing everything out. So, for example, here's a C, if we're spelling an F, C, F, and here's an A. There's no awkward doublings, except this A comes very quickly as a passing tone, I guess. Um, but then this C, this C has to be here. Um, well, I mean, it could be here. This C has to be here. Uh, because you, you have a doubled C, which then comes down to an A, so it's all balanced out, so that's why um, he's holding this over. Uh, if you put, for example, like an, uh, an F, an F would not make sense right here. Or an A, an A, for example, would just be too impractical. Like an A right here, or even an A right up here, it, it would just be too squashed or uh, literally impossible to play. Uh, or if anything else, really awkward to play. So... Uh, he's keeping this all within the register, so it's it's a combination of composition, uh, compositional technique, uh, as long, uh, along with the piano writing. So keeping everything within an octave is nice uh, for the pianist to play. And we also see how nice, and there's no E's right here. He could go down to an E, but he doesn't. So this is really good voice leading. Uh, everything is full. Here's our uh, here's our B flat. Uh, so he's he's very careful, very careful on balancing all the chords and everything. So, uh, and he does this in all his music, all of his sonatas. Uh, he he's never careless. He he's always very intentional. So let's get rid of all this. Uh, what's my next point? Looking at my notes. So he repeats the same thing. Now we're going into a new phrase, a new uh, contrasting phrase. A little, well, not really, but it's it's a little bit different. So this C sharp uh, puzzled me for a little bit, but then it turned out that I think what he's doing is borrowing from the minor. And when you borrow from the minor, uh, there's a couple different ways. I call it a what do I call it? You're borrowing from a uh, modal interchange. So I write that as an M. I modal interchange at least that's what I was taught but it's a passing tone it's uh it's a chromatic passing tone essentially and it just gives a little bit of flavor to to the music da 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 dum ba dum bum ba dum same with this, this is a chromatic passing tone ba dum 
or actually, well, more of a, yeah. So, and then, uh, he's basically just varying this up, essentially. Da -da -da -bum. He's keeping more or less the same rhythm. He's ex obviously excluding this little rhythm right here and just, re and just holding it over. Now, there's another thing that I'd like to talk about that I haven't talked about before because I didn't know what the word for it was, but it's uh, very important in terms of the the forward movement of the music, and that's what's called motor rhythm. This is something you may have heard of in Baroque music. Motor rhythm. So, for example, in Baroque music, there's always a sense of movement. There's, um, you could have, for example, uh, throughout any any part, there's always going to be, maybe, for example, in a piece of Bach, eighth notes, just constantly running through. Um, but it doesn't have to be played by just one instrument or being passed off by one instrument. For example, uh, how can I illustrate this? So... If you have a, I'm going to use the staff right here, you could imagine maybe your first violin might play, uh, how do I illustrate this good? Uh, it's pl playing some kind of uh, rhythm like uh, like this, maybe a syncopated rhythm. This might be really ill bad illustration, but then you can have like a second violin playing the opposite of that, and that would create the illusion, the audio, the auditory illusion of eighth notes running. So you have a deca deca, you have this, this oscillating uh, rhythm going through. It's a very bad example, I think, but, uh, but I hope you get the idea. That's kind of the idea of motor rhythm. And motor rhythm really helps propel a piece of music forward. It gives it some drive. It, there's there's always something happening on the downbeat. And uh, if you don't have a voice going somewhere, then it feels like it just stops. So, for example, in the MIDI file, it's a really annoying feature is there's a... Uh, which note was it? There's, there's like a certain note. I think it's in this section... That doesn't play and it drives me nuts. Uh, I don't remember what note it is, but uh, it's it, it just it stops the music completely. But uh, getting back on track, though, um, back to voice leading. So here he's got this this nice little, little slight variation, uh, uh, an answer. Maybe you could call this whole phrase before it an antecedent, and you could call this maybe a consequent, even though that's not technically correct. But uh, it's like someone stating something. Ba -da -dum. Oh my God. Oh my darling. Na -na -na. Something like that. I don't know. And then someone else replies. Ba -da -da. Oh, uh, mm, what's the piece? Ba -da 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 -ba -da so it's a consequent. It's, it's, a, it's a sentence. It's rhetorical. And Beethoven is always very rhetorical in his music, so it's sometimes, I mean, that's what I always imagine his music. It's very speaking-like. It's its similar to speech. It's like a conversation. You have all these inflections. You have these pauses. You have all these different rhythmic elements, which make something feel rhetorical, uh, speech-like. And that's that's always the sense that I get in his music. It's its its very deliberate, I think. Uh, he wasn't the best melodist, but he could write a damn good melody and develop it if he wanted to. So we've got a little bit of different accompaniment in the left hand. Very simple. And again, it's just balancing out the chords very nicely. Triads. And then, like, for example, this... Uh, we're in bass clef, okay? This uh, C is very important to be here and not for example to be here because it would unbalance the chord it also be really boring because you you're doubling the the fifth right here so i mean just little things like that tiny little things i mean would it have been the end of the world if you wrote a c right here no i don't think so would have made the music uh a little bit less musical perhaps perhaps i don't think anyone would 
would notice too much, but it's that attention to detail that really separates the men, the men, the boys from the men. So it's, it's that, uh, and, and, and as a, as a consequence, he's also got this nice contrary motion, which I've talked about in several other analyses, which is very important in music. It's a, it's a good rule of thumb to try to adhere to contrary motion as much as possible. Uh, the general idea, I mean, you can't do it all the time, but you want voices to be coming towards or going away from each other um, as much as you can. And the reason you want that is it makes the music much more obvious to listen to. It, it, it separates the voices out a lot, uh, a lot better. So we're going to move on a little bit more. So we've got measure 10. We've got this repeating phrase, and he's instead going up an octave uh, like he did. Uh, no, not like he did. Like he did right here. Oh, I guess not. So he's going up, he's repeating the same thing, exactly the same thing right here. And now this is a, a bit of an extension of, of all this. So he has this nice climax. Uh, yeah, he's got his climax. Uh, well, his, his the, the highest notes right here. Then he's got this nice uh, fake climax, I would say, because he's written a fort sando. And he's doing some really interesting harmonic stuff down here as well. You can do that on your own. Nice bedtime reading. All right. And then he repeats the same thing again, only this time he adds very slight variations right here. So he adds a little a little turn right here, he adds another turn right here. Uh, everything else is exactly the same. Now, I was thinking about this the when I was doing this, and I was puzzled by why he didn't write repeats, going back to that. And... A, another reason might be with these little variations, I always feel like I'm lost sometimes. I never feel like, oh, is that the last phrase? Is something else going to happen? So, because I know this is coming, and this is very exciting. So, he, he, keeps, he keeps us guessing. I don't know. Like, I'm always surprised by this sonata. Like, I'm always, I, I never know if, 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 for example, this is going to be, like this section is going to be the last time I hear it, or oh, did I hear it? You know, was it one time or two times I'm supposed to hear it, or maybe three? So he's he's keeping us guessing um, all the time. So it's it's uh, it's good writing, nevertheless. Even if it's very simple, and I think it's deliberately simple. It's a I feel like it's a parody almost. He's saying, oh yeah, you know, very Mozartian almost, uh, very baby easy. Comp, uh, very simple harmonies, but he shows us that, you know, he's very capable of writing uh, more complex harmonies should he want to. I mean, he's proven that to us, and he proves it to us in this next section right here, and then in definitely in the next uh, movement, he'll, he'll unleash the chromaticism. So, that's the end of the A section right here. I call this A, and we're gonna I need a different color. We're gonna do B. Here's our B section, and this is a very strange section. It's uh, very contrasting, uh, extremely contrasting. The first section, the first A section, this is very lyrical, very song-like, cantabile. This next section is anything but. It's not vocal. It's not pretty. It's not ugly, but it's it's certainly not beautiful. And the reason what makes it not beautiful is first is he writes a forte, which makes it uh, raises the volume a little bit, raises the energy level. And he writes these. Now he writes these staccatos, but these I think are meant. These are wedges and not staccatos specifically. Um, these may be interpreted as staccatissimos 
which have a little bit more bite. A little bit more bite to them than my regular staccato, which is just short. It's not supposed to be pink. It's 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 just a short like off off quickly. Uh, these are more attacking on as opposed to off. So, uh, like a staccato is is more of a bump bump. Is is I, I don't know. I imagine it just being an off 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 off. So where this is more of a more of aggressive, a uh, sharper rhythm. A dot 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 dot. More harder, uh, punishing sound. I guess you could say. So but not ugly. I, I don't think this is ugly. And when I was going through the sonata, this this section struck me as a Bach invention, uh, like a two-part Bach invention, is it starts out like, like one, except he's using octaves and he's using triplets, but these triplets become ambiguous uh, a little bit later, for example, right here. And... Uh, so he, he starts out correctly for the first uh, few bits. So this is an exact uh, a canon at the octave up till this point. Everything is the same up until right there. Up until right there, then he changes this. And the reason he does this is he wants, again, this contrary motion. You see it's either going toward or it's going away. And this is just good writing. Uh, this makes it very easy to identify both of the voices. And you see, he's he's always doing that. Uh, there's a little exception, but um, this is just for this is just a little wedge for him to get to see right here. And then he does it again. Bump, bump. This this E. Pretend it's not there. The the canon starts with this C again like it did right here. It starts an octave lower and goes up here. So what is this piece trying to say? That's up to you. At least this section, I have no idea. Is it contrasting? Oh, hell yeah, it is. Hell yeah, it is. And these sforzandos make it very heavy and are uh, blurring the bar line, so to speak. Now, this piece is in 3-4. And if you artificially write these sforzandos, you create the sense of the, th this section being in 2-4. This is called a hemiola. Hemiola. Is that how you spell it? I think so. And uh, this is just a neat little composer trick to, to trick you, to make you think that you're in 6-8, actually. Uh, where you're actually still in three four, you just you just can't count it correctly. At least you you naturally want to count it a different way. Now it's been a while since I played this, so let me go ahead and back up. Uh, let's see, back up to the point where I can play play the piece. Let's see. <laughs> You can hear dot 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 one two three four five six one two three four five six one two three four five six. Those if those sforzandos wouldn't be there, it the music would feel very weird, uh, even more weird than it does now because he's it, it would feel awkward. It'd be like, what are you doing? You're shouldn't you just change meter? But he's not doing that. So so if this by the way if this sounds a little bit familiar, this dot 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 dot, you're thinking of the second movement of the ninth symphony which may have been unconsciously inspired by this little bum 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 perhaps perhaps 
But uh, the nice thing about Ableton is I can actually slow this down so you can you can hear more clearly the uh, let me slow it down a little bit so you can hear these voices actually uh, coming towards and then going away from each other. So let me do that. I'm going to back it up a skosh. Let's see. Slow it down even more. a little far ahead then but you could hear I mean uh, I hope that helps articulate really that he, he was very conscious of voice leading he wasn't you know you see these voices I mean they're going up this voice this they're constantly going down bum 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 so this is just building down and so I mean this is very smart writing He's, he's not accidentallying himself. Is that a word? It is now. He's not accidentallying anything in this music. So, I mean, this all flows very nicely into each other. And then you have this nice pedal, uh, which makes it just a little bit more idiomatic uh, for the hands. Makes it a little bit nicer to play if you have this this C right here. And then he, he, he just, you're just changing hand positions right here. So, it's it's... It's, it's not difficult. You're only having to think really about the right hand moving, and this is just, this hand is, is static. So you're not having to think too hard about this. So it's, uh, I don't want to say it's easy, but it's it's more manageable, I think would be the better word to say. Um, then instead of having like another voice, maybe trail off, and but you get the idea. So Sforzfandos are an important contrary motion. He, I mean, I'm going to just harp on this all the time, every single lecture. I mean, look at what he's doing. Uh, contrary motion constantly, it, it really highlights, it really brings out these voices. And then he's got this this really weird climax. And all that. And then this becomes a motive. This will become a motive a little bit later. And so we'll see, and again, bringing it all together, nice chromaticism. And the, so we're in F major, and he stops right here on C major, right here. Which, yeah, yeah sure, we expect this. I mean, C major is five in F major, so we're, we're totally fine. Uh, where we're not fine is this part, E flat. Uh, what? So E flat major breaks out right here, and he's this is just a uh, a copy and paste of what just happened, except we're in we transposed to well E flat right here. Um, doesn't stay there, but it's. I first looked at this and said E flat. That is okay for an F major. That is the seventh. And this, and that doesn't make sense. The flat seven of F major, this, that doesn't make sense. So I kept on looking, and I said, well, it could be either a chromatic median, which seemed kind of weird, or um, what else did I put down here? Uh, yeah, so I think it could be a chromatic median of. C major. Now, what's a chromatic median? It's a third related key. So, uh, let me see. So, if I go over here, so if I spell it C major, for example, C major, C, E, uh, and G. Now, you could take the. It, it's it's spelling out basically another chord, borrowing a common note between. Uh, these two. So, for example, E flat major and C major have G, the note G in common. So, if I spell out uh, very carefully, yeah, we're doing pretty good. So, we have this common note right here, this G. He might be doing that, 
or he might be going to some other key. I don't know. Maybe I'm looking too much into this, but to me, it feels like a chromatic mediant. It just, it's shocking. And it should be shocking because it's not what we expect. You might expect a dominant, you might expect a subdominant, but E flat major from C major is very bizarre. So, uh, so that's my little lecture on that. So he repeats the same thing again. He's got this little Bach invention, I like to call it. I mean, it's exactly the same thing, except transposed. Um, so we're going to skip, skip a little bit more. Uh, so he, he stops right here in A flat. And A flat's still very far away. A flat is really far away from uh, F major. Um, a flat could be considered the, let's see if I get this right, the relative major of, no, that wouldn't make it either. Well, basically, if you're in F minor, uh, a, my a flat major is the, rel let's see if I get this right, the relative, the relative major, relative major. So he's still pretty far away, regardless. And he then fragments this little this little section right here, this little triplet. So this this section right here, after this point, he said, "All right, this is enough. Uh, we're going to go home. We're going to go back to uh, A." So he needs to modulate back to F from A flat. So that's really what he does. And I don't know about you, that doesn't seem very fun to analyze all this, so I'm not going to do that. But you see, he's just taking this and just 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 doing that. You, you, yeah, so <laughs> he's just taking this little tail piece and he's just sequencing it. And repeating this whole thing right here uh, as a whole. Uh, doing that twice. Uh, this is F major, but he's not technically home right here. This is all messy now. Uh, he's in D flat. Goes back to D flat. And then he's sequencing again. He's just fragmenting this this little this little ending right here. Now he's he's smart enough not to have a note right here, not to have like for example a uh, I don't know. We could have a D flat, I guess. Uh, it's a D flat. He could have a D flat as a triplet connecting here. He doesn't because this, this for example, the way he wrote it isolates the voices much better. It makes it much easier to hear this entry and then this little entry right here. Again, and then he's again very smart, going up the octave, going down the octave, utilizing the registers of the instrument that's at his disposal very smart and then he's then sequencing this little fragment working his way up kind of breaking it down deconstruction I think might be a good word for this deconstructing the material uh, then you've got this little pedal repetition he's you know the more times you play a note, the more it'll become, it'll sound like you're in the tonic, or in this case, the dominance, but uh, this will actually come back later in the movement, too. Uh, so he wants to kind of drive this home and be like, hmm, this little motive. And it's just, uh, it's this, this half-step neighbor tone, this escape tone, I think that's what it's called, escape tone, or double neighbor, maybe. So he's got this double neighbor going, and it's very chromatic. Na 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 da 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 na na. Not the most singable, but he's going to bring that back in movement too. So let's go ahead and play. Maybe a little bit quicker of a tempo. Let's crank it up to about about there. We're going to play a little bit after. Well, right where we were at. So here we go.
All right, so we're gonna stop it right there. Um, so we're just gonna touch a little bit briefly on the uh, the return of the A section right here. Uh, nothing too much to talk about. I think it's pretty obvious what he's doing. Uh, it starts right here. Here's A. I'm gonna call it A prime because it's a little bit different, not exactly the same. And he's just varying it up. We don't want to play the same thing over and over and over again, but he definitely does. I mean, it can't get enough of this theme. So he says, "All right, 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 right. We're gonna, we're gonna. Fun time's over. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna start varying this up a little bit. We're gonna start. And I can't really explain too much about this because this is his own touch. This is his own way of of variation. So." Uh, the right hand's the same, more or less. Or, sorry, the left hand's the same, more or less. The, the harmonies are the same, but he's still very, quite, uh, quite aware of what he's doing. He's 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 not just willy nilly, you know, having a variation. He's still, oh shoot, maybe he's not. He needs to see right here. Hmm. Okay, so he is kind of being a little bit careless right here. He, you know, we saw last time. Oh, okay. Maybe not. Maybe I'm wrong. Oh, maybe I'm wrong. Okay. So he, he's very careful again. So he's he's still very aware of chord balancing and whatnot. So, and this is a very, I'd say it's a very humbling variation. It's not the most you know, creative. It's not the most intriguing. And um, at first I thought this was him being lazy, but clearly i mean beethoven is not a lazy composer he he is very capable he is a very hard working man so i think this is very this is this feels like a parody on like oh <laughs> this this is all you can do uh, this reminds me a little bit of the uh, uh which is not a it's the uh the opus 31 number 1 sonata ba -bum, da -da 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 -dum. So that sonata is a is a joke sonata. It's a funny sonata. Maybe I'll cover it later. But uh, basically, I think that's what he's doing. He's he's making fun of people who aren't as creative or or just kind of you know you get the idea. So he's variation, variation, variation. A little bit of syncopation. Uh, I'd have a little bit of fun at this. I mean, personally, I wouldn't. I mean, the way I see this is, is play it like a parody. I mean, or a joke. Uh, I mean, I, I can see him being a little pass. I can just see Beethoven playing this very passive aggressively to his contemporaries and being like, oh yeah, huh? Is this all you can do? So that's at, le that's at least how I see it being approached. And then him just hitting you in the face again with this. Here's B, B prime, because it's not the same. Uh, we heard a little bit of it, and it's very short. Uh, a lot shorter. And it seems a little out of proportion. It seems almost uh, improvisatory. It's like, oh, I don't have any more ideas. Uh, let me back it up then a little bit. Back it up to the end. So I'll just shut up. Here we go.
Okay, so that was throughout the rest of the sonata. So at least the first movement. So uh, a couple things. He's he's breaking it down. He's got he he's got a false sense, or he at least introduces it falsely, thinking that it's going to be another B section. So he's breaking expectation. He does have these uh, sforzando uh, outlining another hemiola, but uh, it's 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 not. It's it's just a little quotation, I guess you could say, of the B section, because uh, he ends it very abruptly. Um, because we just cannot stay away from this theme. I think this is a parody because Beethoven, as much as he loves mo his motives, I don't think, I think he would have at least some conscientiousness of knowing when enough is enough, and this is too much. And I, that's why I, I feel it's a parody. At least it's got some humorous undertones to it. And I don't think it should be played entire. it shouldn't be played very seriously. It shouldn't be played too seriously. Um, like this, this is very pedantic. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. These are just triads. Uh, it, it's not a very careless way of writing, but it is, he could have done better if he wanted to. And he could have thrown it up another, if you want to make it more dramatic, he could have put it up another register, this right hand, but he doesn't do that. So I think he's trying to make a big gesture out of this. Then he throws down an octave. We're back again. Da, da, da. Different voicing this time. Uh, this B flat's a nice, a nice touch. Oops. This is a, this this is a nice little touch. I wish we heard more of this. Actually, this is just the minor, uh, but it has a little bit of bittersweetness to it. That nice bittersweet undertone to it. So it's a nice touch. Da, da, da. Same thing. Same thing. Same little variation. And all of this is just him. Uh, going crazy basically just just really going at it left hand's pretty identical uh i mean this is just variations so there's nothing really much to talk about so it's just him having fun essentially um the the left hand is very similar if not the same as the right hand or I'm sorry, as the left hand in the previous times we've heard the uh, the A section. So, and now he's coming down to this this little cadenza. He's preparing for this cadenza right here, which he's done before several times in his sonatas. This is just a little bit extravagant, I think. It's 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 it's, it's not unlike him, but it's definitely stepping outside his his usual personality zone. Uh, yeah, it's all very pretty and everything, so it's really not much else to cover really there. You got your cadenza. He has a 6-4 right here. Uh, real cadenza brings it back, and we hear the theme yet again for, thank God, the last time. Which I would almost call a coda. Even though it is the same, it's, 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 it's a coda. He's got this pedal. He's using the lowest note to really emphasize uh, the that that lower register of the piano and it's full where else my notes have uh, other than the obvious thing like fragmentation right here Dum ba dum bum ba dum bum ba dum bum ba dum bum. Now this is interesting because he's bringing back that uh, that B section material, that triplet idea, because he's well, he writes it in triplets. And here's this very dense. Uh, I didn't bother trying to analyze this. this. Oh, this is probably some sounds to me like some uh, diminished ninth chord, perhaps. Again, I haven't analyzed it, so I don't know. You can go go for it. That's a lot of notes for me uh, <laughs> to look at right this second. Uh, but what he's doing, it is, I think, quite clever to bring this to bring this. Uh, Caroline. Okay. So basically, to bring this 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 giant climax 
to taper it off. You have this uh, this in th- triplets, and then you have this in uh, duplets, and then he's right to decrescendo. He could have written Kalando, but that would have meant slowing down, and I don't think, uh, well, he's written Kalando before, so I don't think we're supposed to slow down. Maybe a skosh. Right, to piano, and then just builds his way back down, exactly the opposite of what he did in the beginning. Remember the beginning of the sonata? He started low, and he built his way up. Well, here, he, at the end, he's, he is up, and then he built his way, he's building his way back down. Um, that's the first movement in a nutshell, and it's quite symmetrical in its structure. It's humorous. I think it's, uh, it, to me, it feels passive aggressive. If you understand the culture at this time, uh, 1804 again, it, it feels like he's mocking a little bit. He's, he's, he's mocking a little bit of the, uh, uh, the improvisatory nature of all these, especially Italians. He didn't, he was not very fond of the Italians at this time. He, he was very jealous of their, uh, uh, their success. And he's like, oh, they're just writing just for film or for, or I'm sorry, for film. He's writing just for show and whatnot. And he's, you know, anyway, second movement marked Allegretto. So that means not fast, but also not slow. So moderate, maybe a little bit on the quicker side, but uh, this is a very contrasting movement we've got here. It's very different. And this is only a two movement sonata. So it's. It's very different than the movement we heard. And this is where I think Beethoven had the most fun because this is this is something we can sink our teeth into. Very technical, very very smart way of writing, very intentional way of composing music, uh, this second movement. Now again, this second movement begins, and I keep thinking invention. By Bach. This is a Bach invention. You've got a little figuration, a little motive, a subject even, and he repeats it exactly the same thing in a canon. This this F is taken over a little bit late by here. Uh, he could have written an F right here if he wanted to, but uh, that would have made this this entry not as effective. Uh, especially with this uh, sforzando piano right here. So he's he's very careful in his articulation, and this, this is like a little bit um. This has a lot. This is very robust. He could have also have just written this as a, a half note. He could have just written this as a half note tied over there. That wouldn't have given it really any character because it's not unusual. And this is what the difference, again, separates the men from the boys, is he's very careful, and just attention to detail is immaculate. This could not have been a motive had this been just an F uh, half note tied over to another half note. And it would function just as easily. Just This is totally fine. This is an amateur or a, a, someone who's not considered great, you know, lower tier, uh, th- this would have been totally acceptable, but he doesn't do that. He he goes the extra mile and adds this this little, th- and it's just two notes. It's just or it's just this this, and you'll see he uses this, and it to the ear it catches us and be like, huh, that's interesting. It's a signal, Da-da-dum. because this is exactly the same. So again, he's starting at a low point, and he's building his way up. And this, this, I'm going to call it a subject. This subject, let's call it X, is very open to, it's by nature, the way it's written, it's very useful. It, you, can, you can really easily pick this apart and deconstruct it. He's just building triads, and these are just sixths, just working their way up the scale. Bum, bum, dun, 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 bum. So very simple, but the simplest things, you want to start with the simplest things in music. And this is something I tell my students is have, have a simple idea. Start with simple 
and then make it complex. Because you can't have something that's complex and make it even more complex. You have to simplify it. So, when, for example, for writing fugues, you want to have a very simple fugue subject because uh, it's going to get complicated. Once you start adding voices on top of it, you're going to have to start juggling more things. If you're already juggling five balls in the air and you need to juggle uh, nine, then it's going to be you know even more and more difficult. So if you juggle, for example, two, start with two, and then work your way up slowly. So start with something simple and then pick it apart and make something complex out of it. It's basically what I'm trying to say. And again, he gives himself plenty. He gives himself the whole sky to work with right here. Uh, he gives him a little bit of room right here, but he, he ends the last movements down here. So he's he's starting in a nice middle ground, a nice, you could say maybe a tenor range. So you have the alto voice right here. And you're also thinking about instrumentation or orchestration is very important in Beethoven's music, especially his piano music. Uh, you might be thinking, wait, what? This is a piano piece. And you're right, but if you imagine that this was a score to an orchestra, you can start hearing all these different instruments uh, weave uh, themselves together. For example, you can imagine this maybe being played by a cello, maybe, maybe string quartet, here's second violin, uh, here's a viola, perhaps, and here's the first violin right up here. So you can imagine all these voices. So he's not thinking about the piano. He's thinking about this. His approach to the piano is is a uh, is an orchestral way of approaching the piano. Uh, Mozart, for example, didn't do this. Nor did Haydn. Beethoven is really one of those those rare composers who saw the piano as a a symphony, an orchestra for the fingers. And he, and not just in terms of how loud it can play, sure, he does do that, and he, sure, he does have pianistic techniques, but he's, I always get the sense that he has an orchestra in his mind, and he's trying to hear that in his head and put it to paper on the piano. And you have to imagine that these are all, like, this, this is an instrument, this is a different instrument, it could be whatever you'd like, but uh, it could be a string quartet. Actually, this is a really good example of maybe string quartet writing. But um, Mozart didn't do this. And the, for example, I don't want to go too much of on, on a tangent, but um, uh, uh, here is an Alberti bass. You, right? We all know what Alberti bass is, right? Something like bong, bong. Ah, uh, that's bad. What is it? Dun, 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 dun. Yeah, you know, that little figurine. Da -da 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 -da, you know. So that is more or less that, that's a pianistic technique i mean sure strings can do it but it's it's really built and designed for the hands of a piano a piano player not really a not really a string player even though a string player could do it but anyhow so we start an f we build up slowly we have a slight variation da -da -dum. And this is the five, actually he, on this uh, F, uh, well he starts right here, he ends in one for an F, and then he's on five right here, and this leads very, very naturally, wants to resolve right down to this, this F. So this is like a Bach invention, really. Uh, yeah, and he's repeating himself again, right here, these nice little Nice little phrases right here. And um, here's our peak right here. Uh, this is where he starts changing, and then he combines these two ideas together. And again, he's using contrary motion. Voices are going away, and voices are coming together. Right here. And he does that, and he's doing some really nice pianistic stuff right here as well. Um, this is pianistic. I, I, I associate this with pianicism. That's a word. It is now. And he builds himself down right here. He's working his way basically to five, to the dominant, which is typical. 
and he's then bringing back the main uh, the main bar in the right hand or yeah in the right hand right here da -da 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 -da. and he's fragmenting it and he's building 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 you can see he's 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 rising so he's building down he's building up he's not jumping up he's he he, he you have this nice undulations uh happening so he's he's building his way up he's building his way down Uh, da, 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 da. nice chromaticism, by the way. Uh, really fun to analyze, <laughs> but we're not doing that now. He's got this pedal. Uh, let's see. What else do my notes say? He's fragmenting. He's got a pedal. This is Fort Sandos. Oh yes, this is Fort Sandos. But dum, but dum. These these are important. These guys. Uh, for the character. This is to associate to at least to help out the listener saying okay this is important this isn't just a this isn't this is important he's basically trying to uh, illustrate that yes i'm going to be using this again if he has something in, in a soft texture i don't want to say loud or quiet this is a soft texture and then he writes a he writes a sforzando piano that sticks out it's obvious so by having a Sforzando right here, that's him reinforcing that, yes, this is that. And it is. Ba-dum, 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 ba-dum. And this is literally just a scale. These are just scales staggered. In a, you could even, even call them a stretto. But, um, and this is the exposition. Because he ends in five. We're not going to go over all the themes because it's uh, it's it's what I'd call a monothematic uh, exposit. Well, is that the right word? Monothematic because he's using only one theme. He's uh, he's not using any other uh, he's not using any other themes other than this one. This theme motive. Uh, I, I, it's a subject really. That's why I see. But let's listen to it. Let's listen to the uh, exposition, and uh, we'll go on to the development section where things really get juicy. Let's see, we're going to play it right here. I'd actually like to uh, go back a little bit and actually slow down the tempo of the uh, of the piece because a lot of times this you hear this piece played in performance at a very quick tempo, and all these beautifully balanced harmonies are very are pretty much just trampled over. So I'm actually going to go ahead and you can hear how this this contrary motion really helps uh, build this and uh, connect this music together as a whole so it's very obvious that it's uh i'm gonna slow it down quite a lot so you can really hear all these 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 wonderful harmonies blending together so let's hear Let's go ahead and talk about the next section. Um, so this next section is going to be the B section, and this is the the development section. This is where Beethoven gets to you know flex his muscles and show 
show off his composer skills, what he can really do with this material that he's given himself. So let's go ahead and find out. And I'm going to actually go ahead and speed up the tempo, raise it back up to uh, a little bit on the slower side, just so we can focus on the music a little bit more instead of being awed by a fast virtuoso. So um, here is the development section. Oh, no. <laughs> Hang on. Hang on, let me go ahead and it, it did that. It shoved me all the way back to the beginning, so I need to find it again. Uh, why does it do this to me? There should be a way in Ableton to, yes, there is. Okay. Um, so, where are we? All right, so development section. We're going to go ahead and pause it right there. Wow, that's a lot of stuff, right? I mean, he he really went to town on that, that subject that he uh, presented himself. Uh, so we're going to make a little note. Where is it? Right here. We're going to put a line right there. That is the recapitulation right here. Recapitulation. So let's talk about this. And... So what is Beethoven doing here? Uh, so on the surface, it's he's just presenting himself again. Uh, what did I write? In uh, the the subject, well, it starts up here. So he's presenting the subject again in a in uh, the same the same way he presented it uh, at the beginning. Only this time we're in A major. Or at least, uh, well, it starts in A major. Now, A major is quite far. It's a third related key. But we can simplify this, that A major is the 5 of D minor, which is uh, the 6. So it's the, the relative. It must be the relative. I always get relative and parallel minors mixed up. Uh, so it's the where's it relative. Ah. Should be the relative minor, right? Sure, it's the same key signature as F major. So it should be relative minor, right? 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 Okay. I always get that mixed up. So it's five of six, 
right? D minor. So, eh, it's not too far away, but he's an A major, which is, if you're looking at it superficially, yeah, this is a chromatic mediant. You're going from C, well, there's, well yeah, there's the other thing, you're going from C, which you're, you're in right here, and you're going to A major, which is quite a jump. Uh, this is a chromatic mediant in this case, because you're using the note E, in this case, E natural, as the pivot note. Because uh, E is, you have E in uh, A major, and you also have E in C major, so it's a, we could look at it that way. Um, he is probably thinking that this is 5 of 6, I'm guessing. Because that would seem a little bit more more conventional, that would seem more in the, the style of that time period. So, he introduces it the same way. And it seems like he's going to be doing the same thing, just an A major, because it's what he does. Now, here's a little bit of a difference right here. This is different, and he's going to be reusing this little thing, this little mode, not really a motive. It's just a figuration, I guess you could call it. And he's he'll be using that pretty. Uh, pretty heavily later on, but you see he's he's this 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 opens the door to so many ways of modulating and going to different keys and he must have had a blast uh, composing this because it it just morphs itself into into the, into different keys and he explores it and how he gets to them. I'm not gonna go into how he gets to different keys. trust me I, I just I just won't you can do that on your own but uh, he he really expands on this whole section of uh, of, of building da -da 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 -da. this 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 part. He he just builds and just sequences it quite a lot, and he's keeping contrary motion. So he's got this pattern that he wants to maintain, right? Contrary motion. Um, this is also very nice to play on the hands. He's keeping everything again within an octave, so it doesn't make things too awkward to play. Uh, that said, the uh, occasional weird things that aren't quite as idiomatic or as nice to play uh, should be ignored every now and then in order to, uh, or at least be sacrificed in terms of the quality of the music. Uh, I'll clarify myself on that saying when we get to a point in the music which will make sense later, but for now just take my word on it. So. And he, he builds these phrases, and he's he, this this the nice thing is this builds up and down very slowly, and it, it allows him to gives him the freedom to really g go wherever he wants with it. it. It again opens the door very nicely to uh, to building, and, and, and of course he's building down. He has this nice climax up here, this high point right here, and he's building very slowly. I mean, over the course of however many measures this is, down to here. And he's now chromatically building down. He's he's on a flat rate here. And this is a lot, a lot more vigorous, as we can see. And he writes a sforzando next to all of them. And he's just fragmenting the first little, uh, little motive that we saw in the beginning of the subject, the first bar of it, rather. And it's not exact, uh, especially. I mean, the first this is exact. This is not. So it's a it's a bit of a variation. It could be backwards, but he's building chromatically down, and uh, it's interesting. The whole idea of contrary motion applies here as well because he's he's building down in the left hand very slowly, but he's building up with the right hand. So. And his goal right here through all of this is he's trying to modulate to G major, as we'll as we'll see. Here here becomes very interesting. You see these notes in parentheses. These I don't know if they're either they're uh, I'm not quite sure if they're by the editor or by well they must have been by the editor I assume. Yeah, they must be by the editor or it could be by Beethoven, but. Uh, these are basically just notes that are outside the register of the piano, and if the piano becomes 
you know, if the, now we have 88 keys, we have this, uh, what is that, it's an E available to us now, we can, we can play it and we can assume that he, uh, because of the pattern he had before, assume that he would have probably wanted an E, this E octave and, and so on and so forth. And same here, he probably would have wanted a D, uh, a D octave, however many letter lines down that is, probably right there. He probably would have wanted that if that was an option for him at the time of his composing this piece, but of course it wasn't. And man, would it have led really nicely to to this uh, uh, this G right here. But he has to make sacrifices due to the limitations of the instrument. So I'm not telling you how to interpret it, but, uh, you know, you could. But then again, he doesn't write that. I don't know. It's not, an, it's not an interpretation class, this lecture. But now comes something interesting. We're in G major now. And something new happens. This. This is a new... A new motive I'm calling Y. Uh, we haven't heard this before, it's a syncopation, and this syncopation we can um, relate to based on the syncopation in the variations in the first movement. And do I think this has something to do with it? Yeah, maybe. It might have a little bit to do with it, but this is new material, and it's I mean, it's a variation essentially on the, the pedal the held note that we had before and this gives it a lot more drive it has I mean syncopation all will naturally drive a piece of music um, no matter how dry the material is it'll rhythmically propel it forward uh, as long as the syncopation is in some way interrupted or has ended at some point if, it, if you have constant syncopation always happening um, then you're you're gonna give the listener a false sense of where the bar line is, but he, he does it very briefly, uh, very carefully and very uh, smartly musically. So the effect is here. And here we have our, our old friend here again. Right, I called it X, there we go. And a little bit of a variation here, and we're going to be using, substituting in, I think is a good word, substituting the uh, held note for a syncopation of the pedal. Because he's doing the same thing here, going up here, switching registers. Boink, he goes down here, goes down here, throw it up the octave, gives it more, uh, more interest. Now, why he didn't? This was a mystery to me. Why he didn't? Th he didn't put an octave right here, for example, a G octave. Um, it might. Mm, I don't know. He could have, trying to get from this octave down to this C right here may have been a little bit kind of awkward because you have to play this with five. You could play it with four if you have larger hands. Your pinky and then you have to reach this C um, quite quickly and it might make for a very ugly uh, and unfortunate performance of it. So, and also it makes this, this C a lot more impactful because you're up in the tenor register right here and then you're down in the, the, the bass register so you have this very clear contrast. Uh, and we're in C minor right here. Uh, it's not a Beethoven sonata unless he tonicizes C minor. <laughs> so, he's, so that might be one reason. And so with this G, it's very easy to hit this C with the, the, the pinky and the five right here. So, I don't know, just speculation. So he's playing around with the keys, uh, very much so. And one of the idiosyncrasies of this, if that's the right word to use, uh, little imperfections, for example, look at this little thing right here. Uh, this is a little weird to play, I'll, I'll, I'll admit, this will, would be kind of... A little weird, but it's it's a it's a musical or a performance sacrifice for musical uh, benefit, if that makes sense too. So basically, he's trying to uh, he, he's trying to set up this pattern again. You see how he's he wants to keep this this pattern of this this contrary uh, going away 
uh, and towards each I mean this is this is beautiful I mean pianist will tell you this is nice to play this will fall right under the hands this will be very uh, lovely to play um, so he wants to keep that pattern and one way you could do that is is have a little sacrifice because he's got syncopation and then he's got this little entry right here so again it's a minor performance sacrifice in order to to, to keep consistency up is one way you could say for it. Um, now something interesting happens. This section is all new. This is a very pianistic section right here. And this is a new texture. And he's contrasting this. So we've had very, very clean, very flowing, uh, music up to this point we've we've had it has, hasn't had very many interruptions and now he introduces a uh, very aggressive interruption right here in terms of in the lower register with this dun 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 uh the, these this this contrast between fortissimo and piano and he doesn't write a crescendo at all so these are subito these are sudden and this, this is very angular, I think. And again, we're modulating again right here through all this section. And, uh, you know, I in my analysis and preparation, I, I just didn't even bother. I, and you know things are getting serious if your key signature reads one flat and you start writing double flats. So, uh, see, he's, he's going far away. He's, he's going quite far. He's actually going to A-flat major. So that's this section right here, and he's these sforzandos kind of remind us, uh, in a way, re of the uh, sforzandos we heard in the B section of uh, the first movement. These, uh, yeah, these sforzandos right here. So that's what he was, I think, trying to refer to a little bit. Yeah, we're in A flat major. He's just going to all sorts of keys today. Major. Now this little figuration is a little bit of a fragmentation, and uh, this is a chromatic, very chromatic passing. This, this B double flat to the A flat right here. Yeah, it's it's, uh, and he'll start recycling this. So in this, this we saw. And this might be a bit of a stretch. Where'd it go? Yeah, right here. Eh, probably a bit of a stretch, I think. But it's new material, nevertheless. It's, it's, it's. All of a sudden, this doesn't become important. This is the line, and the reason it's it's, it's important is we also see that uh, this this voice. The right hand isn't moving really too much harmonically. It's staying relatively static. And this voice, he also writes a slur over it, so it means, you know, not only legato, but this is the important line. Na, 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 boom, boom, boom. And then he goes to a different key. He's, he's changing keys constantly. So he's, he's sequencing this uh, quite a lot. And then, gosh, as if as if double flats were enough. Let's throw in some sharps too. Let's let's go to, uh, what key is this? I don't know. I don't know. I'm not going to bore everybody with that. Let's uh, A major. I don't know. So he's going to somewhere else, and he needs to modulate back out. So, but the important thing is that he that even this, <laughs> even this gets sequenced and developed as well. Ba -da -da. This, this, this whole thing. So he, it's just constant, it's, it's constant recycling of the material that he's doing. And, you know, you, you don't need to be original all the time is he's figuring, you know, I've already done 90% of my work in measure two and measure one and two. 
is, I mean, this is, this is it. This is all he needs in order to make an entire second movement of a sonata. And it's absolutely, absolutely incredible that he's able to pick apart. I mean, just absolutely everything in this very humble subject. So and occasionally add some new things. I mean, but the, the new things are, they're not, the, they're, they don't need to be complex. I mean, this is very simple, arguably. It's not the most lyrical, but it's a, it's a very decent and contrasting complementary uh, subject uh, that complements and supports what's happening above it. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's wonderfully written and it's also written in thirds. We can also see, so you can see he's keeping up the thirds, but this time it is in, uh, it's in similar motion. I don't know if, no, that's not parallel motion, but it's similar motion. But he's maintaining this, uh, these pedal points constantly. This is a typical Baroque thing to do. So let's change colors. We haven't changed the colors in a while. What color should we do? Let's do purple. And he's building his way down chromatically. So he, again, he must have had a blast doing this. And again, this little details like having a staccato, staccatissimo rather, rather uh, on the, 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 because he could have written a slur, right? He could have written this all under a slur, but it definitely wouldn't be as robust in character. So little things like that just kind of help make the piece feel more personal and more have a lot more charisma, right? It's more interesting to listen to. So he's throughout all this process, right? Through here, we reach C major. So at least he knows that home is, is coming soon. So when we reach the dominant, that should be an indication to us that, aha, okay, we're on the dominant, that means that we're probably going to be coming home pretty soon. We're coming back to the recapitulation. And we are. Absolutely. So, he he abandons pretty much, uh, pretty much this and goes back to the, uh, the main theme. So the subject is right down here. Now we've got the nice little syncopation. Boom. Bum, 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 bum. So he's bringing this new thing that this new, uh, I called it Y, this new motive that we introduced uh, just shortly, which we haven't heard for quite a while. When was the last time we heard it? Right here? Nope, right here. So he says, okay, enough of the syncopation motive. We're going to be going into, uh, we're, we're going to be focusing on this for now. And. Oh yeah, by the way, here's this again. So he he gives you little like here's here's a little bit of something. Here here focus on this for now. Uh remember that thing I told you a little bit earlier? Okay, well we're bringing that back in now. It's like a speech. It's like a speech. It's like a story. I mean, after how long everything is connected so well. It's 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 you move away from something but yet the, the storyline is still here and you know that oh here's 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 Johnny here he's back again he he needs to he, he he's not going to go away but there's not too much Johnny in here so very clever writing I mean he's 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 pretty good he's a good composer um he doesn't let us forget this right here as well and this is something we saw earlier as well in the, in the development section but uh but again, he's just fragmenting, essentially. He's just splitting the hands apart, invention style. Uh, constantly changing changing uh, positions, rather. Switching the, the voice to the right hand and the left hand and syncopation. He does this constantly. This is just good writing uh, in general. Uh, now we're building down, and then another fragmentation. But this is him building, really building towards the recapitulation, which we already see down here. 
uh, just constantly building down, building down. And we already know that we are very close to to home because we don't see any accidentals anymore. Okay, we maybe with this one here, but after that, uh, we know we're pretty much firmly in firmly home. But we don't know it, and he he smuggles it in. He kind of just 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 brings it back in without really any preparation. Normally in a sonata, if you want to bring back the recapitulation, um, not a rule, but a, uh, a common practice is to have some sort of pedal tone on the dominant, a dominant pedal tone of some kind. In this case, it would be a C. And I mean, I guess we kind of have that, but it's very concealed. I mean, we know we're, we are in C, but uh, he doesn't have a conventional pedal tone like um, many composers might have, and even himself. I mean, it's... And even in sonatas after this, he'll, he'll do that, too. It's a common thing to do, just to really make clear to your listener where where you're going with it. So we bring back the recapitulation, an octave higher than was introduced. And we also have a pedal. So he's kind of have this backwards. So, like, this pedal should be over here. <laughs> so, but uh, the filling out, I mean, it, it would sound very naked if if this wasn't here at all, if this F pedal wasn't here. I mean, uh, I can't do that right now, but, or play it like that, but, uh, I mean, you can just understand, if you know the Sonata pretty well, you can understand how, how dry it would sound without this. So he brings us back in F major, like normal. He has a crescendo, so he's building, 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 building. Let's see, what else does he do? So he's building up, and he... He goes, it's a pretty... Well, it's not the most conventional way of writing a recapitulation. I mean, he clearly brings back the main theme right here. Uh, whoops. But what he does after is very, uh, actually ra very refreshing musically. He goes into B flat. Uh, am I have it? Do I have it right? He goes into B flat minor. After going into B flat major, actually, uh, where is that? I have it marked right here. Yeah. This this. Uh, this is actually very refreshing. This is a very nice musical uh, thing to do. If you're in a major key and you kind of smuggle, smuggle in the minor, this is a very, very rewarding musical experience right here. But it doesn't stay in here. He doesn't overdo it. He doesn't stay in here for very long. Um, let's go ahead and actually play it. I don't think we've played the recapitulation, so let's, uh, let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to back it up a little bit. So 
That was Dakota after that. So um, let's talk a little bit about their very interesting recapitulation uh, here. Um, so is it's not the well, it's not exactly the same as uh, the exposition, which it shouldn't be. But uh, the things he does is quite interesting. So remember this little motive from the development section. So he brings that back. And he, he, he just highlights it. He just quotes it. He, he doesn't spend too much time. He uses it as a transition uh, to get to here. And you see, he's 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 not making too much of a big deal out of it. He I mean, he could have thrown it down, or actually, he could have. Uh, he could have put an octave right here if he wanted to, if he wanted to, but he decides not to. Um, and also, the problem with that is it might conceal the the voices. Uh, this 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 uh, uh, this D natural could interfere it might sound like it belongs to the right hand if not played correctly so I mean, it's not the, I mean, again not the biggest issue but it's definitely a a good reason to not have it so so that's what he's doing and the rule of threes apply here so if you're going to quote something do it in a set of three so he does something so introduction Re, uh, reinforcement, reflection, and then variation. So he's, you know, or shortening. You could also, our diminution, if you want to be technical, diminution. You could also, uh, not as common, you can also augment the th something that you've repeated three times, uh, though it's more common to fragment and shorten it. So, so that's kind of what he's doing right here. So, what else do I have in my notes? So yeah, it basically allows us to hear the voices uh, much more easily. And he's just fragmenting like a beast right here. He's just this lot. This is just basically this is all fragmenting. He's he's building things sometimes backwards. Uh, like for example, this little guy and. This rest, again, I think this this allows us to hear these voices much more clearly. These these two entries, and he's building up again. He's he 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 came down, and he's he knows he wants to build back up. So that's exactly what he does. As we can see, he does this. He's just building up and up and up and up, and then he's he he leaves us hanging right here a little bit, and then he comes back down and does the same thing over again. So. I don't think this was very much pl planned, and I say that very lightly, but um, it, it seemed like things just worked out very nicely for him, but again, I could be wrong. But I mean, I, I don't want to analyze this, because uh, we could be here all day analyzing all these chords, and that's, we're already here all, all day. So, in... Uh, Earlier in the lecture, we talked about uh, this motive, which I said was going to come back later in movement one, and it does. So let's go ahead and look. So movement one. Where are you? This little move. This little thing. Da 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 ba da 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 da. This chromatic neighbor tone, our double neighbor tone, I believe, is the right terminology so we have a glimpse of the second movement at least a little tiny motive so to speak a little a little flavor appetizer well, what's going to be coming later and he's he it's not obvious i mean it's not blatant but it's but he definitely makes use of it he 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 says, yeah, this was intentional. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm borrowing this. Um, and he's just fragmenting, essentially, with a little bit of syncopation. This is a new texture, completely new texture right here. And this is on a 5.7. So there's lots of tension 
in here and this just adds a lot this is really adds a lot more tension right here this this, this chromaticism so and he, and he dwells on it quite a lot uh repeats it and we have the coda and the coda is pretty straightforward it's pure allegro so it's gonna be quite more a lot quicker and he starts out the same way but uh, he makes it more interesting he he starts adding these uh, inner voices which fill out the uh, f fill out this motive quite a lot more than it by itself and he's got this pedal again this pedal is the same pedal that we had in the recapitulation the beginning of the recapitulation so this this doesn't come out of nowhere and he's just building up with his right hands a little bit of fun octaves got through here and but again he's 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 careful about building to get well yeah he's building down so he's so he's got some contrary motion going there so he's building to a point and then he's repeats it again same thing and just one final last hurrah so you he just fragments this this little uh, figuration from uh, from that motive the, the very beginning I mean it, this is just economy at its best yup bum 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 and here's our syncopation again switch hands so that's in the right hand these these this fifth this fills it out quite a lot more um i don't know why he doesn't put an f right here well oh you know it could just be for chord balancing i think yeah, this would probably be a better chord balancing instead of putting the an octave for example getting rid of the c is putting a an f octave uh, i think the c it's a little bit more aggressive too. I, I hear it as a little bit more has a little bit more bite. And he just ends. Yep, bum. No preparation, no big finish. Well, I mean it's kind of big, but I mean it just uh, these syncopations just kind of come to a screeching halt. And uh, that's pretty much it. So he it's it's a quite a weird finish it's a very weird piece of music and if you're playing this and you think it's not weird then try to make it weird because it is weird it's a weird piece of music it's um it's one of beethoven's again lesser known pieces he he doesn't really get recognized and hailed for this sonata certainly not this sonata um but it's still a very carefully written piece of music and he was very deliberate in composing it and um i think we should i think you know it's it's like a like all of our children we treat them with the same respect and um you know matter of fact as 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 anything else so i don't know where i was going with that but basically it's got its own character it's got its own uh idiosyncrasies and it's it, it, its own personality and we, we need to bring that out and uh, diving into the music like this is not only just fun but it also helps us understand what we're actually listening to and kind of grasp the whole big picture and uh, even though we don't need to go into harmonic analysis uh, even though it might be interesting to see what keys he goes to and how he combines these keys to you know, make the music personable but uh, that would be really dry and uninteresting to be honest so looking at big key centers is was really my focus on this lecture i think you know getting the overall big scope and also looking at all these other little things to take away like why did beethoven do that why 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 not something else and trying to investigate why he does something can help us as composers understand and you know say oh i like that idea I'm gonna borrow that for my, you know, my my piece of music, or 
borrowing that idea. So, um, so with all that said, let's go ahead and listen to um, the last little bit of this sonata, and we're going to go ahead and uh, we'll go ahead and call it a day right there. So, let's let's back it up and um, to around the end of the recapitulation, and have it go into the coda, and I'll see you guys all later. So here we go. Mm-hmm. 